Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stu Hershkowitz, and I'm with a colleague by the name Brenda Bachman. And first, we wanted to thank CBIA for having us present this afternoon on, I think the topics today are very timely with the challenges that are going on in the world today. Uh, clearly, the stock market volatility the last uh, year or two have been very challenging for employers and obviously investors, employees that are in retirement plans. Uh, so we're going to spend about a half hour today. Um, myself and Brenda, we're two of the senior folks with H&H. &H. Uh, we're involved with a lot of the retirement plans, 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans that are in the municipal world. And uh, we've got a lot of experience with that. Just a quick background. Some of you may know of our firm. We've been in Connecticut now over 64, five years. Um, we're one of the larger regional full service firms in the Northeast and we're uh, in Bloomfield. Um, we've got about 80 employees and we're involved with all retirement plans from pension, cash balance pension plans, actuarial needs around those plans, um, the administration of pension plans. Uh, we are involved with 401k, 403b, TPA, administration, record keeping, consulting. And then we've got an investment advisory firm that we act as fiduciaries on retirement plans as well. So we've seen it all. And um, if we can be of any help to you as we go along through our presentation, questions and answers, you can, you'll can you see a chat box on the bottom. We'll be glad to answer questions at the end. Uh, Brenda and I are gonna keep going for about a half hour. What we're gonna talk about today are financial wellness, uh, it seems to be a big topic in employers, and it's definitely coming down market into the smaller 401k space. So Brenda's going to take some time there. I'm going to come back on and talk about some trends that are a little bit worrying in the 401k, 403b space, um, and then some tips uh, and resources that are available for you. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Brenda. Thanks, Stu. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining well, you know, the financial wellness and education um, is a difficult thing to define, but we look at it as giving your employees the knowledge they need to succeed, uh, certainly in the financial world, creating an awareness, giving them understanding so that they can take actionable steps to improve their circumstance and improve their knowledge base. There are a number of studies that give um, detailed information about why financial wellness is such a significant need for employees. The one that we refer to frequently is, is the Price Waterhouse uh, Cooper so, uh, study that's done annually. And you know, employees are telling us time and time again that financial stress is just dramatically impacting their life. I would say that over the past couple of months, that's probably even worse. These statistics don't include the more recent significant inflation and the, um, the, the international conflict situation that's impacted our financial world. But generally speaking, employees are telling us time and time again that financial stress impacts them in, in any number of ways that are harmful, both at home and at work. At work, they're telling us, and for you folks to have actionable items, uh, retention, uh, mental health, productivity, and we're going to illustrate just a couple of things about each of those areas uh, where financial lack of information or financial stress um, is, is hurting uh, your work world. Uh, retention, boy, financially stressed employees are twice as likely to look elsewhere. Um, certainly there's a number of reasons for employees to look for jobs elsewhere, but uh, financial stress is one of them. And a significant percentage are telling us that they would be attracted to another company that cares more about their financial well-being. I, I don't have that deeply defined, um, but if they get a perception that there's some place that cares more about their knowledge base, they're likely to move on. And with the job market being so, so very um, difficult these days, um, uh, your world um, just becomes even more weighted with financial issues from your employees. And the 65% tell us that that's a primary reason that they do change jobs. You know, for the mental health continuum relative to 
financial stress, you sort of almost it's a, a continuous cycle. Where do you stop and where does it start? But it impacts the retention, uh, the engagement, how they engage with each other each day at work. Uh, there's significant productivity impact to uh, financial stress and then attendance. Uh, as 7% of the folks tell us that they're more likely to have their work impacted or their attendance impacted by financial stress. Uh, the, the next, the, the productivity, and I, I kind of go to the lower right circle that, you know, net net, there's potentially a four weeks of productivity lost because of financial stress in every year. That's a significant amount of, of people hours. So what we like to do is provide ideas um, and give folks the tools they need to take the stress, financial stress out of your lives. These challenges, you face them every day. They are not new. We'd say they're decades old, but recently it's an exacerbated situation because of the pandemic. And even since the pandemic has been lessened a bit, um, maybe even more so, we see the financial stress. There's a, a newfound urgency. Uh, many folks saw personally um, how uh, physical health can impact their financial well being and it can have just a meteoric financial downfall. And then, the, as I mentioned earlier, the domestic and global events in the post pandemic situation certainly have put all of us on the edge. And we have found in the past two years that technology has made delivering these programs significantly easier. It's taking the edge off, if you will, of finding a necessary conference room for people to leave their workstation and go to a training session. Using technology has given us, given us a leap forward. Um, it, it, technology that folks are now more familiar with, the Zooms, the, the WebExes, the GoToMeetings, whatever the uh, Google Meets, whatever the technology is that you may use, uh, we find that that has made delivery of these programs significantly easier and employees are more likely to take advantage of the opportunity to learn something new. Again, it's put out an invitation, have a topic, they hop in or zoom in um, and, and learn a little bit more about something they might be interested in. Get the approach, whatever approach you might take, you can take an easy approach or you can take a less easy approach. And again, uh, wellness emphasizes the ability to manage stress to, to reduce uh, my insecurities, both emotionally and, and, and financially. My easy approach, you can use your current retirement plans website or platform with their embedded calculators and videos. I have a client company that they monthly pick one of their record keepers videos and they put it up on a screen in their lunchroom and they run it once an hour. It's a eight or 10 minute video on a financial topic and the employees get to um, be made more aware of that topic during their lunch hour. And they do that frequently. It's been helpful uh, to the employees. Uh, you can build a library, old fashioned books or online. And at the end of this, I've given you some resources of books that we have found um, employees have told us are helpful to them. So we'd like to share that with you. And we'll do that at the end. Hold Zoom sessions. Goodness, invite people. Doesn't have to be during the workday. We've done things for folks in the evening or late afternoon. Um, uh, why not a, a happy hour Zoom, if you will? People can uh, log in. They don't have to be seen. They don't have to talk. They can hear about the topic, have the topic recorded, and then push the recording out to employees who were not able to attend so everyone gets benefit from that information. There's certainly a less easy approach. I never say hard, but it's just less easy. You could build a survey, create a wellness calendar that includes a variety of health and wellness topics, finance being one of those wellness topics. Wellness Wednesdays, two to three times a year, um, and then have Zoom or live recorded events, alternate your topics with, between emotional well being, financial well being, physical well being. You might even wrap that into your open enrollment time frame um, and have finance be part of that learning session. Thoughts on where to begin? Well, we touched a little bit on this, but you would build a strategy that works within your environment. Certainly, 
the white collar office might have different needs than the factory floor or a different um, technology base through which to deliver. You'd have to find something that works for you folks. And I would suggest that working with your um, retirement consultants could be helpful to ferreting out the best ideas for your population. Uh, consider a survey. A confidential survey is easily done through something like constant contact um, and have the employees tell you what topics are causing them financial stress. Create a message that are, that's appropriate for the level of the audience. Position the learning as part of your internal training so that financial learning becomes part of your ongoing training curriculum. Keep in mind that changing behavior, uh, certainly relative to finance and in many other areas, as many of you folks know, it's a long-term view. So if you're looking for behavior change, it won't necessarily happen um, immediately. It's more incremental and, and building in the, the adult learning context of a longer term view. And we always encourage to recognize that cultural differences could play a significant role in how your message is received. Money is emotional. Uh, folks' culture, their family, their embedded fears, could be a barrier or a curtain, if you will, that you need to work through and around to get the message across. And what Stu and I are, are, are constantly saying is don't ignore the elephant in the room. Right now, it's the market volatility and inflation. We always say, why not have a 15, 20 minute session on market volatility and inflation and try to keep, fo keep folks um, fears a light a bit, with it, the impact is on all of us, but it's good to teach them about inflation so that they can hopefully take some stress off of their shoulders. Here's another, some other ideas. Again, we execute a survey, take action on the employee feedback. Don't try to guess what's on your employees' minds. I'm big on this one. It's not always about investing. How about budgeting? How about something about 529 or college funding? Possibly you have an HSA with your benefit package. Why not teach them a little bit more in a single session about the triple tax exempt nature of HSAs? Maybe a session on life insurance and not necessarily selling it during an open enrollment time frame if with a voluntary product, but at a separate time so that they might see the value and should um, it, it be pertinent to the needs of their family. Create a calendar, lay your topics out over 12 to 18 months in cooperation with possibly your consultant or your uh, retirement plan um, client manager. You can buy content. You can create content. Again, this is sort of the back to the easy way or the less easy way. There's content already out there that you have access to. Use that or you could create your own. A couple of PowerPoint slides, getting information off um, Investopedia or using folks like us to help you create content that's pertinent to your audience. And again, a reminder that you're changing financial behavior and that really is a long-term endeavor. Embed those topics into any existing training calendar. There's some cautions that we add about treading lightly. Again, the behavior changes through education over time, but the kitchen sink or the fire hose strategy is not something we recommend. Well, since we're gonna have the employees together for 40 minutes, we're gonna talk 10 minutes about their investments and another 20 minutes about their HSA. And then the last part of it's gonna be about um, uh, the, the S&P index and how it can be helpful to them. You know, it's, it's, it's possibly too much for people in one session. Break it down into chewable chunks for folks and in topics that they would be interested in. We're, we're a strong advocate that your session leader or your presenter should be a fiduciary and or someone with no, veteran, no vested interest in whatever financial decision that your participants or employees would make. I'm prone to saying to people, my career plan, my life plan, my retirement plan doesn't change given an investment or education decision you make, 
but we know that we've given you the tools to make a good decision. So you just need to be careful that you're not putting the fox in the hen house relative to potentially investment or purchasing a product. And then often the most decorated leader, the person with the most initials behind their name, isn't always the best person to lead the session. Those folks, and Stu and I, we joke about this and we're trying to be careful of it. Some of those folks, they tend to talk over the audience, which increases the financial anxiety. And please keep in mind that your goal here is to lessen the financial anxiety. Folks could be reluctant to ask questions in a group. It's part of the financial anxiety that folks carry with uh, around with them. Again, money is emotional. They might be embarrassed by a question. Always make time for individual session. Certainly no financial advice from ERISA guidelines. We can't give advice, but we can coach, we can encourage, we can teach, we can show, and we can discuss all helping the employees reach a better under, understanding of the topic at hand. And then certainly progress check-in. If there's a session a month or so ago on, on budgeting and many of your folks young to the work world attended that session, why not a check-in? How's the budget going? What can I do to be helpful? There's always a way to break down the barriers and decrease the anxiety. I call this my laundry list. On the left, it's just a dozen of easy education topics. There's probably subcategories to all of these that many of your employees might find useful. How do you deliver it? Well, you can gather people post-pandemic. That's a little, a little different now than it was before in some of your work environments. Again, the Zoom in, the webinar. How about just a, a recording that's made on for the employees and that recording gets pushed out so they can watch it at their leisure. Many ways to do that with today's technology. Um, the personal coaching, certainly. Uh, maybe an appointment after a group meeting with a fiduciary, review their goals. Let them ask questions in a, in a setting that might be more personal. Um, we find that that's very popular with, with some of our client companies. And don't always limit the session, especially afternoon evening sessions, to the employee. If it's a pre-retirement discussion, why not have a spouse or a partner also invited or possibly an adult child that could be interested in what decisions their parents may make. Lots of ways to, to, to peel this onion and re reduce the financial anxiety for folks. Here's a very simple year round calendar. This has sort of a, a full boat, if you will, of, of topics and not many of us in our work world have time to deliver all of these things in one year, but if you pick one topic quarterly and keep working around the circle of the year, uh, you could have 12 or 13, 14 topics covered in a, your 12 to 18 month time span um, without too much difficulty. So build yourself a calendar and make it pertinent to the year. Uh, during your third quarter, when you have pre-open enrollment timeframes, that might be the time to um, roll out a, a, a new discussion for folks that may be thinking of retiring in the come, upcoming year. Here's the books I mentioned earlier. Um, I find all of them useful at different levels with different uh, education levels of different folks I meet with, but they have all been helpful to somebody uh, and they don't sell a product. They give ideas, they help a thought process, um, they suggest pathways uh, this, these books could be part of your hard book shelf or the virtual download and make it available on your internal website for employees to use. Here's a few of the um, studies that we have found to be helpful. Uh, if you folks are trying to build a case for um, any cost to a, a, a program like this, the information in these studies, some of which I quoted earlier, I believe could be very helpful to you. I will echo what Stu said that certainly we are available for questions um, after the session. I'll be hanging on. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone, so to speak, over to Stu, and he's going to take it from there. All right. Thanks, Brenda. All right. So 
401k plans without question are the main uh, retirement plan for employees today or 403b if in, in the not-for-profit world. And clearly with some of the rule changes the last few years with the safe harbor rules that allow employers to almost get rid of any discrimination testing um, and the auto enroll benefits, pros and cons of that. If you need some more information on safe harbor plans and auto enroll, please let us know. We'd be glad to get you some information on that, but that's absolutely why plans are becoming more and more popular. A trend that we are seeing in the marketplace right now uh, in the 401k world, the 403b world, what is happening? Lawsuits, class action lawsuits are happening more and more in 2020. Uh, you saw a significant jump in lawsuit activity, class action. Um, there are definitely enterprising attorneys out there that have access to a lot of fee information and 5,500 information, and they are definitely marketing their resources to encourage or look for employees or former employees of organizations, and thus we are seeing a lot of lawsuit activity out there. Settlements, these are just settlements, and there are plenty that keep going and they don't settle, but look at the level of the top 10 settlements in the ERISA class action lawsuit 401k world the last few years, significant dollars, um, and it is continuing to rise. Um, what we are seeing is the focus of these lawsuits are really in four primary areas. Um, the fees of these programs or the excessive fees that a lot of these lawsuits are saying that plan sponsors are and participants are paying excessive amounts. Um, or inappropriate or imprudent investments or lack of choice of investments, um, self-dealing where there are vendors that are in this space that obviously besides the record keeping, the administration, they want to offer their products and thus the products may or may not be appropriate. Um, clearly there's pros and cons to that. And then these products that are offered the revenue from the investments, uh, the cost of how these plans are paid for, it's all built under the subject of revenue sharing, how much of the revenue is going for the investment fees and for all the other administration record keeping fees. This is a mid, mid and large market focus primarily, but now we are seeing it come down to the smaller plan marketplace and multi-employer plans, what are called MEPs, that are around the country as well, that we are seeing it more and more in other markets than just the mid and large market 401k space. Some examples, some larger companies that we're familiar with here locally in the Northeast, um, Estee Lauder, it was um, their plan, $1.6 billion plan, and the lawsuit ultimately settled was on administrative fees and costs and the investments were not being monitored and reviewed on benchmarking on how the performance of the funds are doing. Costco, obviously a uh, well-known organization around the country, very large plan, and they had not been doing a good job. And uh, ironic, where at Costco, you're looking for lower cost volume of products when you go to Costco, but they were not necessarily doing a good job managing their 401k participant costs, and thus um, they ultimately settled in a large suit. Uh, Voya, a local insurance company here, formerly ING, was part of the Aetna retirement business before it spun off. Um, they clearly an excellent company, but they have an underlying interest of offering a lot of their products to the plans that they're servicing as a provider. The products may or may not have been appropriate Ultimately, there has been a lot of settlements in that area. So there's three large organizations that these are the types of examples that we're seeing way up market that are starting to come down market. A big area that we are seeing more and more is the investments that are offered, what class of funds or what class of mutual funds are being offered. 
Um, it's a subject that a lot of people, you know, get intimidated by. It's, you know, those prospectuses that are now all online, but those little booklets that can be pretty intimidating. Most people just sort of throw them in the nearest trash can, but those prospectuses have a lot of information and what type of mutual fund class is being offered to the 401k or the 403b plan. You know, there's different, the same investment fund that's managed by Fidelity or Vanguard or other funds, but they have different classes of shares or different cost structure depending on the negotiation by the plan sponsor and the tough questions that are being asked by a retirement plan committee. If you have a retirement plan committee, if you don't, but this whole area of this seems to be a big focus that most participants um, and employers have not been necessarily doing a great job managing the cost of the funds uh, or the types of funds that are being offered. You know, last couple of weeks, perfect example, I met an employer uh, in a local town here and they had a mutual fund, uh, an index fund that they were using a Vanguard mutual index fund paying two or three basis points. I met with an employer down the street from this company, similar size plan. They were using an insurance company where the Vanguard index fund was two or three basis points with the insurance company, the index fund was 0.5% for that same index fund. So these funds, index funds or actively managed funds, and they all have different ways, different cost structures, different wholesale versus retail. And in the investment business, in the mutual fund share class world, are you in institutional funds in the middle somewhere or retail price mutual funds? The cost structure and understanding all of the fees that are in these mutual funds, what's going to being paid for the actual investment management and what's being paid for all of the other services. What's happening in the marketplace is employers are going, small market is starting to happen, but it's been a phenomenon mid and large market where they are moving to an institutional price mutual fund. The lowest cost fund and any and all other fees that are in these mutual funds. So here's a sample menu of funds that are typically offered, index funds, active funds in all these categories, but we're seeing a big trend, but still the minority where employers are saying we want to offer institutional price funds and any and all other fees are going to be fully transparent, fully disclosed on the statements to participants so they see it. And it's not just the once a year fee disclosure that most people don't understand those 404, A5 disclosures that employers are and these plans are required to give out. So this is a trend that up market is starting to come down market. Some areas that you as an organization, um, if you have a committee or if you don't have a committee, you may wanna think about forming a committee, documenting what you've done as an organization that you formed the committee. Um, but what we're seeing are the areas of the focus are in these lawsuits, up mid-market, coming down market is the range of investment options. Again, the fee structure, have the fees been assessed? Have they been benchmarked? There are a lot of resources out there in the industry where every other year you can benchmark your fees for your plans, um, do an RFP periodically, generally recommend every three to five years to do some RFP work on your retirement plans? Um, is there a process in place at your organization for reviewing this? Is, there, is it documented, the process that you're reviewing with a committee? Um, are we looking at the mutual fund share classes? Are our plans large enough where we can negotiate a lower share class? In the Costco uh, lawsuit, they were in retail shares, billion dollar 401k plan, where the exact same funds could have been in institutional shares. So making sure that your plans are in appropriate share classes, 
is their process, is their documentation in place, and are the vendors we're using, clearly they have an agenda to be offering some of their products or a lot of their products. Are the products that are being offered being benchmarked? Are they meeting the standards to be maintaining a place in your investment lineup? Bottom three points that I wanted to mention to you this afternoon, very important note to file. What we are seeing is savvy organizations putting in their plan documentation, putting in their plan SPD, summary plan descriptions, where they're putting in limitation periods, where if employees or former employees or retirees of your plans want to raise their hand or raise issues on your retirement plan if it's outside of a particular period of time that you're setting as the limitation period very critical most plans necessarily don't have this period or what we call limitation period you may want to consider that working with your attorney or your plan document providers to be doing that um, putting in language that before a former employee can raise lawsuit with an attorney, there are arbitration requirements that can be put into your retirement plan provisions to require the organization with a former employee, disgruntled employee to go through an arbitration before they can go through any further lawsuit activity. And also what we're seeing is certain states there are certain states that you may want to litigate your retirement plans um, if it's a national law uh, firm and they're based out of chicago and you're based here in connecticut you can put in limitations and documentation where any potential lawsuit activity would be handled here locally in connecticut you don't want to have to go to chicago to deal with illinois courts when your documents say any and all issues would be handled here locally in Connecticut. So defining where things would be uh, handled if any former disgruntled employees wanna raise issues. So this is critical and this is within the last year or two, we're seeing this really become a big trend in the industry. So in summary, critical for organizations small, mid, large market, not-for-profit, municipalities, if there's any municipalities here today, is having a fiduciary process that's refined, reviewed, monitoring. There's an overall continual, ongoing, quarterly, semi-annual meeting of a committee. Notes of the meeting are documented. Uh, we're benchmarking our plan periodically. The benchmarking is documented for participants, if they wanna have access to that, you make that available, um, but there's an oversight by the appropriate people at your organization, ongoing monitoring the plan, the investments, the reporting of the investments, and every three to five years doing an, an RFP, or many times with our clients, we're doing an informal RFI where we're not looking to do a full formal RFP, but the organization wants some documentation of the marketplace. It's been a number of years since they've gone out to the marketplace. So we would do an informal request for information from providers on the plans of their size of this marketplace. Where are the fee structure? What are the options that are being offered? So making sure that you have a process in place and that you're following it continually and making sure you're asking the questions. One, do you have a committee? Do you have the appropriate people on the committee? And are they, do they have the, the right resources to do what needs to be done for your organization's protections and for your organization uh, following the appropriate uh, prudence guidelines that from an investment fiduciary perspective really makes sense. Um, do you have appropriate documentation in place? Like, are there minutes of the meetings? Um, I'm pretty anal about that, that every time I get out of a meeting with a committee, um, many times on the side of a road, I'm documenting the minutes, get it drafted up, and within a few days, it's documented for the files, documented for the committee. 
Is there an investment policy in place or a GPS, which is a governing overall governing document of the retirement plan committee? What's the investment policy? What's going to be our communications policy? What's going to be our education offering for our employees? Brenda's topic earlier about financial wellness, how that's all going to be orchestrated within your organization's retirement plan, making sure uh, that is documented. And clearly, there's um, the marketplace has shifted away from the brokers primarily involved in this space, where now you have independent fiduciary advisors where by law, their agenda, only agenda, is operating for the best interest of participants and the plan sponsors, and there cannot be any product agenda or any other agenda. Um, that's a risk of guidelines from a fiduciary perspective, and that's where you see fiduciaries becoming more and more involved with retirement plans down market as well. So, you know, with that, I think we have hit the time we were planning for about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, there seems to be a few questions. Brenda, do you wanna hit on some of those questions that we got? Sure, here? actually someone was curious about the deck and the um, availability and the deck will be made available to all the participants post this meeting. They were interested in seeing, seeing having the slides. There was no material question to our, our presentation. But we'd be happy to entertain anything Any if anyone. Yeah. Okay. So I think that will do it. Um, I want again want to thank CBIA and Molly for coordinating this with our firm. Um, if we can be of any help or resources, we've got we've been around a few years, so we definitely have seen it all in the business and. Um, if we can be of any help, please reach out and um, everyone stay safe and uh, enjoy the summer. Thank you for everyone's time. Thanks everybody.